scholarly notes in the Companion Bible, calls these two occasions the first influx and the second influx. And what I want to share with you this afternoon is there is going to be a third influx, and many of you will be witnesses to that, I believe. It's important for us to understand what happened and why the first influx occurred, how did it end, what caused the second influx, and how did it end, what's the cause of the third influx, and how will it end, will be the result of what we hope to come up with this afternoon. Now, there are probably not one person in this room that doesn't know that Antichrist will return to earth before our true Messiah does. I mean, that's the basics of the Mark of the Beast tape, right? But what I want you to pick up from this this afternoon, this message, my, my intent and my hope, is that you realize that it's not going to be just Antichrist. He is going to have a lot of help. He's going to have a lot of company. And these folks are not human beings. They are supernatural. So after we take a look at the first and second briefly, because I know most of you are familiar with that, what we're going to do, though, is look at the, what the Bible says about the third, because that's the one we need to be concerned about. Yeah, it's good to know the history and, and helps us to prepare spiritually and mentally for these occurrences, for they will happen, I'll assure you. Uh, we're in that fig tree generation. It's going to happen. We're going to begin with scripture I know you all are very familiar with, Genesis chapter 6. You can go ahead and be opening your Bibles there. But I want to remind you of the first prophecy in God's Word. And it wasn't from a prophet. It was from God himself. Genesis chapter 3.15, after that serpent, that is to say Satan, beguiled Mother Eve in the Garden of Eden, God addressed the serpent, and he said, I will put enmity, which is just a fancy word for hostility, between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It, better translated, he, referring to Christ, will bruise thy head, and ye will bruise his heel. And Satan, you know, with his Kenites, most certainly bruised the heel of Christ on that cross of crucifixion. The bruising of Satan's head is yet to come. And something fantastic, you and I can have a part in that bruising of Satan's head. So with that, let's begin our study in Genesis chapter 6, 1. Now, the, the key about that prophecy is what? God promised that the seed of Messiah would come from the, through this Eve. That's God's plan. He stated it there in that prophecy. What's Satan's plan? Send the Nephilim. Pollute that seed line. Thereby, he thinks, I can make God's word fail, and therefore, it'll do away with my own doom. I'll avert my own doom, is Satan's thinking. So... That's the, that's the thought here as we begin Genesis chapter 6, verse 1. Satan's going to try and pollute that seed line. Chapter 6, verse 1. And it came to pass when men, and check out this, it has the article. It's not just Adam, it's Ha-Adam. The man Adam. Began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them. These daughters, of course, what? That's the seed line leading up to Messiah. That the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. Now, the sons of God in the Septuagint and also in the Moffat Bible is translated angels. In fact, it is in Job chapter 1, verse 6. You recall there that God is in heaven with the sons of God. Those are angels. When Satan showed up, you remember that? And God said, where have you been, Satan? And he said, I've been walking to and fro on earth. These sons of God are Nephilim, or if you prefer to pronounce Nephilim, the fallen angels. And should this be a surprise to us? Uh, and, and, and I know people that have not been taught this have a very difficult time understanding this. How could it be that these fallen angels came to earth? 
are we that much different from them? What did God say in the beginning? He said, let us make man in our image. Who was he talking about? Talking about the angels, right? In, in Psalms chapter 78, it says, and man did eat angels' food, that manna that came from heaven. So our bodies evidently are not all that much different from them. Shouldn't be a big surprise. Verse 3, And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man. Check out this word strive in your strongs. It means take a straight course with. And it wasn't God's spirit that would not take a straight course with man. It's man that would not take a straight course with God. For that he also was flesh, yet his days shall be in hundred and twenty years. When Adam fell you know, through sin, God said, in that day you will die. In that day that you partake of that tree of good and knowledge, you will die. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 8, what's one day with the Lord? It's a thousand years. Adam lived to be nine hundred and something years old. Here we see it shortened, a generation of 120 years. There's also a 70-year and a 40-year generation, as you know. Verse 4, sharp enough reason we came here. There were giants in the earth in those days. Giants here, check it out. The Hebrew word is nephil. It's from the prime verb nafal, which means to fall. These angels refused to be born through woman, as was God's plan, and either came of their own volition or Satan sent them, in my opinion, to just pollute that seed line of woman. Underline this next phrase, and also after that. Whoa, and also after what? Also after the flood. So we have here the second influx already predicted. When the sons of God, here again the angels, came in unto the daughters of men. Well, what happened when somebody comes in to somebody? And they bear children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old men of renown. This men, the last word, uh, the second to the last word men there is gibor, word you're all very familiar with, the giants. And you know what? People that don't understand this scripture have a very difficult time explaining the Goliath that David slew. Where did those giants come from? God said, Christ said, I foretold you all things, and I'll assure you that he did if we take the time to get into his word and learn about it. Verse 5, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. After the Nephilim came to earth and taught man, as it's written in Jude chapter 1, verse 7, it states there that it's just like their day of the Nephilim are just like Sodom and Gomorrah going after strange flesh. They taught man a lot of evil, but not that man needed any help. Verse 6. And it repented the Lord. He was sorry, in other words, that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. Verse 7. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth both man and beast, and the creeping thing, and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. It hadn't happened yet, but after the seventh trump it will, right? There won't be any more flesh man. There won't be any more flesh animals. It will happen. Why didn't he do it then? But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. That unmerited favor, that, that unmerited favor that he gives you and I, even though we don't deserve it sometimes. Verse 9, how and why did Noah find grace? These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man, meaning he was a righteous man, and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. And you're going to have to check out this word perfect here. In the Hebrew, it's tamim, and it means without blemish, specifically in regards to pedigree. In other words, Noah and his sons, the three and their wives that went on the ark, had not mixed with the Nephilim. So here we see God's plan going to bring Messiah through the woman's seed. Satan's plan, get the Nephilim involved, pollute that seed line, 
making null and void God's word, therefore averting the doom that he knew was coming his way. What was God's plan? Well, in case there are any uh, Bible thumpers listening that only thump the New Testament, let's go to Second Peter chapter 2. Y'all keep in mind, I know you have know this material very well, and I promise you some new material, but we also have to be considerate that when we rebroadcast these programs, we've got people listening in that, that haven't heard this before. You know, it's all new to them, so let's be patient with our brothers. Second Peter chapter 2, what was God's plan when he saw that the seed line through which Messiah would come was polluted? Let's pick it up with verse 1. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them. He redeemed us, in other words, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. God won't do it to them. They bring it upon themselves. Verse 2. And many shall follow their pernicious ways. This means ruinous ways. You might think of rapture theory. By reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. What is the way of truth? Christ is the way of truth. If they teach a doctrine that leads people away from him, and they're ready to fly away when the Antichrist returns, that is speaking evil of the right way of Christ and not recognizing him. Verse 3, and through covetousness shall they with feign, this means fabricated or false words, make merchandise of you. They'll even sell your soul if you're ready to let it happen. Whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. God knows, and that damnation will happen. Now the reason we came here, verse 4, for if God spared not the angels that sinned, Whoa, wait a minute. What do you say about a little child when she looks perfect? She's a little angel. The little angels sin? There's some of them that do. But cast them down to hell. Check out this word hell. This is the only place it appears in the New Testament. The Greek word is ta ta o o, and it means to incarcerate in eternal torment and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. That's almost verbatim, Jude chapter 1, verse 6, of those that refused, that left their habitation. That means that they left heaven. They refused to be born of woman, which is God's plan, and they came to this earth to pollute that seed line. How did God get rid of them? God's plan, verse 5. And spared not the old world, but save Noah, the eighth person. He was the eighth generation from Adam, is what this means. A preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly, keeping that seed line clean. And Abram took Sarai, and later her name changed to Sarah, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their substance that they had gathered, and the souls that had gotten in, the souls they had gotten in Haran, in other words, uh, servants, and they went forth to go into the land of Canaan, and into the land of Canaan they came. This would be the land that God would show to Abraham, the promised land. God's plan through Abraham would come the seed of Messiah. Satan's plan, verse 6, and Abram passed through the land unto the place of Sikkim. Now, you all have heard Pastor Arnold Murray say a hundred times, that preacher doesn't know, come here from Sikkim. This is where that comes from, okay? <laughs> Unto the plain of Moray, and here's what we came here for, and the Canaanite was then in the land. Well, no, wait a minute, that, Dennis, that says Canaanite there. That doesn't say Nephilim. Oh, but the Nephilim had mixed in with the Canaanites, and we were seeing these Geber, these giants again. God told Abraham to go to the promised land, and through him would come that seed of Messiah. Satan's plan, let's put the Nephilim back down there and let them pollute that seed line of the land. Then, when Israel moves into the promised land, 
that seed line will also be polluted. We just finished Joshua with Pastor Armory revising it, and, and I, I, I couldn't help but notice a lot of letters that we got. People had a real difficult time understanding how and why God would destroy a complete entire people. And that was his instruction concerning the Canaanites. Satan's plan, the second time, send in the Nephilim. God's plan, destroy them. The sword of Israel, completely wipe them out. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 1 through 4. He started out, don't let any of them survive. You wipe them out completely. You don't give your daughters to their sons for wives. You don't let your sons take their daughters for wives. Let's turn to Deuteronomy chapter 20. How could God des destroy an entire people? I'll tell you why. It was to get rid of this second influx. Deuteronomy chapter 20. And in, in what we have, we're going to pick it up in 16 in just a moment. But what we have here in, in chapter 20 of Deuteronomy are the God's rules for war. We might call it his rules of engagement. And there's some fine rules there, good rules. We're not, for the sake of time, going to cover all of them, but you might at a later time of how God looks at war. But briefly, in, in the verses before where we're, we're going to pick it up, if you were coming up against a city, you were first, depending on who the people were, let's back up and qualify, you were first to give that city a chance to surrender. Right? And if they surrendered and were willing to become tributary and pay taxes, fine, you let them live. But there were certain people that that wasn't the case. Deuteronomy 20, 16. But of the cities of these people, and we're talking about Canaanites, we'll see in a moment, which the Lord thy God doth give thee for an inheritance, thou shalt save alive nothing that breatheth. Boy, now that sounds pretty hard, doesn't it? I mean, we're talking men, women, children, anything that breatheth. You wipe it out. But thou shalt utterly destroy them, namely the Hittites and the Amorites, the Canaanites and the Perizzites, the Hivites and the Jebusites, as the Lord thy God hath commanded thee. This is the second influx of the Nephilim. God's plan, wipe them out. Would Israel obey? Judges chapter 1, verses 16 through about 32, let's say. They failed in a lot of respects of wiping out the Canaanites. The reason God wanted them wiped out, you recall, they'd mixed with the second influx of Nephilim, and we had polluted seed line. And you know what? They were freaks, unnatural freaks, as it's written in Second Samuel chapter 20. There was one that, of the giants that had six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot. You remember him? Unnatural freaks. We, we hear and read in God's Word, I should say even better, of the giants all the way up until the time of David. But it just about cuts off there. So evidently, we see the progeny of the second influx of Nephilim wiped out during the time of David. Now, we could go to a lot of places to document that there is going to be a third influx. We could go to Luke chapter 17. We could go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I'm going to choose a scripture that you all are familiar with. Let's go to Matthew chapter 24 just for a few verses. And again, I realize a lot of this is scripture you all probably almost have memorized but I promise you a good ending to this one, okay? So hang with me as we work through this. This is pretty basic stuff here, I realize, for those of you that have been studying with the chapel for any length of time. But we're going to get to the third influx here in a moment. Chapter 24, as you know, in verse 3, the disciples are asking God, or Christ, excuse me, what's it going to be like when you come back? Or what's it going to be like at the end of this world, meaning world age, aeon in the, in the Greek? The end of this dispensation, in other words. And Christ answered them and gave them, as you know, seven events that would happen. And let's go to Matthew 24. I want to pick it up. Oh, let's begin with 36. Christ speaking. But of that day and hour knoweth no man. What hour is Christ referring to? He's talking about the hour of temptation here. 
that hour that Satan, his angels, the Nephilim, and the Kenites will become that locust army of Revelation chapter 9. No one knoweth the no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But in the few verses before that, Christ also said, learn the parable of the fig tree. If you know the parable of the fig tree, you know the season. You know what will happen in this generation. 37. But as the days of Noe were... Whoa, we were just reading about this fellow, weren't we? Back in Genesis 6, this is the Greek name for Noah. Just as the days of Noe were so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Now, we're talking about future here. We're talking about the second advent. Do you want to know what the future holds? For as in the days that were before the flood, they, this being the Nephilim, were eating and drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage until the day that Noe entered into the ark, God destroying that polluted seed line, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. That's just how it's going to be. The Nephilim came down before the flood. This is Jesus Christ speaking. He says, just before I return, the angels are going to be back again. It's going to be just like, you know, you've got Genesis chapter 6, if you read it, to find out what happened in the days of Noah, you can know what's going to happen just before I return. How would those angels get here? Turn with me to the last verse that's verses that you're real familiar with, I promise. Revelation chapter 12. Well, I, I shouldn't say it that way. I hope that you're familiar with all the scriptures, but I bet you're not as familiar with this scripture that we're going to cover to end this with as you think you are. Or that's my, my uh, gut feeling, can I say? Okay. <laughs> Revelation chapter 12, verse 7. And there was war in heaven. Whoa, now wait a minute. War in heaven. Would that be like we're seeing on Fox News and CNN right now? Mm-mm. We're talking spiritual, right? And I want you to kick your minds into spiritual gear as we finish this up, okay? We've got a long ways to go. I'm not going to get short on you. Now, you know me. I'm kind of like Paul. I get into that long preaching. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought in his angels. The dragon. I wonder who the dragon is. Well, we're going to find out for sure. But pick up here. The, the dragon has angels. Verse 8. And prevailed not, Satan loses. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And this was future, and I think not so distant future, in my opinion. And the great dragon was cast out. You know, we're going to find out who that dragon is. That old serpent, his role in the Garden of Eden, called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Deceiveth the whole world. Revelation chapter 13, verse 8. There's one group of people that he does not deceive. It states there in 13.8, He deceiveth the whole world except those whose names are written in the book of life of the Lamb slain. Since the foundation of the world, you know what foundation is? Catabol. The elect will not be deceived. You've got a part to play in this third influx. Verse 10. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now is come, to, is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God. You know, the kingdom would have come when Christ returned, what came here the first time and was born to that virgin. If the kingdom had been accepted, the kingdom was rejected, was it not? And the power of his Christ for the accuser of our brother and his cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. Who's the accuser? He's that one and the same. The serpent, the dragon, the devil, Satan. Job chapter 1, I referred to earlier. The angels and God were in heaven. And along comes Satan. And God said, where have you been? And he said, oh, I've been walking to and fro on the earth. And God said, hey, what do you think about that boy of mine, Job? 
Satan said, I'll tell you what, you take that fence away from around him, and I can have him. You know what? Without the fence of God's protection around you, without the gospel armor of Ephesians chapter 6, Satan can have you as well. He's got a lot of help, friends. It's going to be convincing. He not only accused Job, he accuses you and I daily at this point with God. Verse 11, And they overcame him. Who? That's the elect. Overcame him, Satan. How? By the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. As they're called up before the synagogues of Satan, written in Mark 13, Matthew 24, Luke chapter 12. Not to premeditate what we're to say, but by the word of their testimony, which is the Holy Spirit speaking through. That's how they overcome Satan and his third influx of Nephilim. And they love not their lives unto death, especially the two witnesses. Verse 12. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. Revelation chapter 9, we find out how long a short time he has. He has five months. That same chapter, Revelation 9, we could go there to conclude this, but I don't want to do it today. Because it also tells us about this locust army. The locust army that will is a symbolic term. It's also referred to as the northern army. They're not actually locusts, as we learn, and, and, and we'll see also when we turn. You can be turned to Joel chapter 1 at this time, the second book in the Minor Prophets, Joel chapter 1. Right after Hosea, you'll find Joel. But this northern army, the locust army, whatever you want to call it, it's the one world system. At the head of it, you have Satan in his role as Antichrist. You have the 7,000, I think, in the Philem. Why do I say 7,000? How many die when Christ's feet touch the mount after the two witnesses are resurrected? Revelation chapter 11. 7,000 men. It says men, but in the Greek it's names of men. And yes, the angels have names as well, as we know from Michael, right? But here we have this locust army, and that's, that's what Joel is all about. This is like reading tomorrow's newspaper. Joel, we're going to find here, has got more information about how it will be just before Jesus Christ returned, the Lord's day. What is the Lord's day? 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. One day with the Lord is a thousand years. A thousand years is one day. The Lord's day is the millennium. This is how it's going to be at that time. Let's pick it up. Joel chapter 1, verse 1. And the third influx of Nephilim is here. We'll see. Chapter 1, verse 1. The word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethuel. Pethuel means vision of God. That's a good name for the father of a prophet, huh? But now, catch that. We're not talking about the word of Joel here. We're talking about the word of God. Hear this, ye old men. In other words, you elders, you that are supposedly wise. Hear this. And give ear, all ye inhabitants of the land. Hath this been in your days, or even in the days of your fathers? Is this what I'm about to tell you about happening presently? Has it happened in the past? The answer is no. What we're talking about here is future prophecy. Verse 3. Tell you your children of it, and let your children tell their children, and their children another generation. Umbilical cord to umbilical cord. God promised that remnant that the truth would be passed down from generation to generation. Now, sharpen up for me. I know it's afternoon and you all got a full belly and you just had lunch, but we're fixing the plow pretty deep here, so sharpen up a little for me here. Verse 4. That which the palmer worm hath left hath the locust eaten, and that which the locust hath eaten hath the canker worm eaten, and that which the canker worm hath left hath the caterpillar eaten. 
oh, that sounds complicated. What does that mean? Those are simply the four stages of a locust life as it matures. It begins, uh, the, the word palmer worm, in fact, if you've got a companion Bible, check out over in your side margin. Uh, the palmer worm referred to the gnar, G-N-A-W-E-R, as a dog gnaws on a bone. The locust is the swarmer. The canker worm is the devourer. And the caterpillar is the consumer. And Bullinger also has a note there in the side margin that this means that the gnawer's remnant, the swarmer eats, the swarmer's remnant, the devourer eats, and the devourer's remnant, the consumer eats. Now, I asked you to kick into spiritual gear here now. We're not talking about locusts. We're talking about the effect that locusts have on nature. It's something we can relate to. God often uses nature in His Word when He wants us to understand something. But don't confuse the symbology with what's being symbolized here, okay? There's a remnant that won't be devoured. There's a remnant that won't be consumed by this locust army, the third influx, with Satan in his role as Antichrist at the helm. Verse 5. Awake ye drunkards, and weep, and howl, all ye drinkers of wine, because of the new wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. This is saying, sober up, or wake up spiritually. Verse 6, for a nation is come up upon my land. This is the one world system. Antichrist at the helm, the 7,000 Nephilim, his lieutenants, the Kenites following right on place. Strong and without number, whose teeth are the teeth of a lion, and he hath the cheek teeth of a great lion. Revelation chapter 9, 8, uh, further proving that we're talking about the same locust army that's being addressed in Revelation chapter 9. He hath laid my vine waste. In other words, this nation, the one world nation. What's, what's God's vine? And God's saying, this is my vine. That's Israel, right? And barked my fig tree. He hath made it clean bare and cast it away. The branches thereof are made white. No bark left on them. Again, we're not talking about locusts here. Remember in Revelation chapter 9, God commanded that locust army. What did he tell them? Touch not any grass. Touch not any green thing. Don't touch any trees. All you can do is sting those that don't have the seal of God in their forehead. We're not talking about locusts, folks. We're talking about Satan, the Nephilim, and his Kenites. And if we continued on in this chapter, which we're not because of time, we're going to skip to chapter 2, verse 1. But if we continued on, we'd see that things get so bad, and we're talking about deception here. They're going to be very, very convincing. The whole world is going to be deceived, except those whose names are written in the book of life of the Lamb slain. That's the elect, that remnant that won't be devoured, that won't be consumed. But they even take away the meat offering and the drink offering in the latter parts of chapter 1. I think that's a direct relation to Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. What's one of the first things that happens when Satan returns is pretty boy Floyd? The sacrifice and the oblation is taken away. That's communion. That's when he appears as the desolator. It's going to happen. Chapter 2, verse 1. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm. You know, Big Mama parked out there behind our studios in Gravit, Arkansas. It's sounding the alarm of this very fact. In my holy mountain, mountain always symbolic of what? Nation? What's his nation? Israel. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. Satan comes first, you know that. And he's going to have a lot of company. Verse 2. This is future now. This is how it's going to be. This is how it's going to come down. What part do you have in it? Verse 2. A day of darkness and of gloominess. A day of clouds and of thick darkness. That swarm of locusts. Again, symbolic now. We're not talking about actual locusts. 
as the morning spread upon the mountains. A great people, these are enemies symbolized by the locusts, we're talking about people here, and a strong. There hath not been ever the like, neither shall be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. That smoke coming out of the pit. That sounds pretty dark and gloomy right there, but you know what? People are going to be rejoicing. You talk about a revival. Jesus is back. Isn't it wonderful? Isn't he wonderful? The whole world. We're going to feel pretty lonely about that time. And if you don't have that gospel armor on and you don't have God right there with you, it will be very lonely, I'll assure you. Verse 3. More about the locusts. This is symbology now. A fire devoureth before them. This is the northern army that we're going to get to here in verse 20. And behind them a flame burneth. The land is as the Garden of Eden before them, lush and productive before them, but what about after they've been there? And behind them a desolate wilderness, yea, and nothing shall escape them. What a revival. The world deceived. The appearance of them, you want to know what this locust army looks like? I'm going to tell us. The appearance of them is as the appearance of horses. Horse is always symbolic of power. And as horsemen, or war horses, better translated, so shall they run. Revelation chapter 9, verse 7, you know, to prove that we're not talking about horses or locusts, it tells us that their faces are the faces of what? Their faces are the faces of men. Revelation 9, 19, where is their power? Their power is in their mouths and in their tails. What comes out of the mouth? Well, I can tell you what's going to come out of their mouth. It's more lies than what you're hearing from the information director of Iraq right now. I mean, he's an amateur. I'm serious. He's an amateur when it comes to Antichrist. And you better be mentally and spiritually prepared for it, friends. Well, what about that power in the tails? Revelation 9 tells us about the sting of that scorpion. That's what they're going to be able to do is sting those that don't have the seal of God. Well, how does a corp the scorpion sting? He latches onto his victim. He injects his venom into the victim. And, and, and his, his, his digestive fluids serve as a stomach on the outside of his body around his victim. And it turns the backbone of his victim to mush. The world is going to be deceived. And, and the whole thought I had in this message today was I want you to be mentally and spiritually prepared. It's not just going to be Antichrist. It's going to be those 7,000 supernatural beings right along with him. And they will be turning the backbones of many to mush. I have every confidence there is not one of you that's going to have your backbone turned to mush where you don't have the backbone to stand up and testify for your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ when the time comes. Verse 5. Like the noise of chariots. Oh, that's interesting. Also in Revelation 9, we hear about the chariots. Are we talking about chariots as a cart with two wheels on it drawn by horses? I don't think so. I think we're talking about the same chariot Ezekiel described to us in Ezekiel chapter 1. Are you ready to look up in the sky and see the same kind of vehicle that Ezekiel saw our Lord's throne coming to earth on? Better be, because I think they're going to have them. And this leap on the top of mountains. What are mountains? Mountains are nations. The whole world to see. Like the noise of a flame of fire that devoureth the stubble as a strong people set in battle array. God even controls this army, as we'll see in a moment. Before their face, the people shall be much pained. All faces shall gather blackness. Terrible translation. Check it out. Blackness should be translated paleness. Verse 7. They, this being the locust army, you want to know what they're going to be like? Shall run like mighty men. They shall climb the wall like men of war, like warriors attacking. Think spiritual. The, the, their objective is deceit. They're going to come in peacefully and prosperously, as it's written in Daniel. But they're going to be pretty convincing. 
and they shall march every one on his ways, and they shall not break their ranks. They're going to be very organized. You know, if you're going to deceive the whole world, you'd have to be pretty organized, would you not? I mean, somebody would get smart and say, hey, look, those guys aren't very organized at all. They're running around like the Iraqis. Verse 8. I can't, I'm kind of stuck on that subject. I'm sorry. Maybe I need to quit watching Fox News quite so much. It is kind of dangerous, you know, and I warn you all to kind of temper how much of that you take in in each day. You know, if it gets to where it's a little overwhelming, open your Bible and read for an hour and you'll feel a lot better, believe me. Okay, where did we get to here? Uh, verse 8. Neither shall one thrust another. This means that they won't get in each other's way. They shall walk or march every one in his path, and when they fall upon the sword, they shall not be wounded. Whoa, physically, if you fall on a sword and you're not wounded, what does that mean? It means that's a supernatural being, doesn't it? It does to me. What about spiritually? What is the sword? And the word wounded there, by the way, can be translated stopped. What's the sword of the Lord? That two-edged sword of the Word, right? The truth. Even if the remnant comes up to them and hits them with the two-edged sword with the Word of truth, they're not going to stop. You know why? They're already doomed. Everlasting chains of darkness unto judgment. Jude chapter 1 verse 6. So they're going to have as much fun as they can with Satan and take as many as they can with them. Verse 9. They shall run to and fro in the city. They shall run upon the wall. They shall climb up upon the houses. Whoa, who's up on the houses? Watchmen? Watch out, watchmen. They're coming up after you. They shall enter in at the windows like a thief. Teachings of Paul, 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 3 and 4. You are not of the darkness, that that day shall come upon you as a thief in the night. 10. The earth shall quake before them. The heavens shall tremble. If you're standing on the rock, you won't be shaken. The sun and the moon shall be dark, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. Here we have another proof of what is signified and that this prophecy concerns future. What happens in Matthew 24, verse 29? Those stars of heaven not only discontinue shining, they fall. Right? Revelation chapter 6, verses 12 and 13, the sixth seal. The main star, Lucifer, that morning star, falls. And the other stars of heaven fall. We're talking about the fallen angels again, folks, the third influx. That's the time being addressed here. Verse 11. And the Lord shall utter his voice before his army, for his camp. Here he's calling Satan and the Nephilim and the Kenites his army. His camp is very great, for he is strong that executeth his word, for the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. And who can abide it? I'll tell you who can abide it. Those that are standing in place with the gospel armor, Ephesians chapter 6 on. Those that know that the wall of protection around them is our Heavenly Father. He is our strength. We trust in Him. We believe the promises of Jesus Christ in Luke chapter 10, verses 17 through 19, that in his name we have power over all of our enemies. That includes these 7,000 natural, supernatural beings as well as Antichrist. 12. Therefore also now, saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart, and with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning. I think the elect will be doing a lot of weeping and mourning because of all the deception. How many seeds have you planted that fell on the stony ground? Family members are going to be taken up in this deception, the seeds you didn't take. God has a reason for it. You've got to trust in Him. But I think we'll have a reason to weep and mourn. And we have a part in this as well. We'll see just in the next few verses. Verse 13. 
and rend your heart and not your garments. The rending of garments was a sign of repentance, although it be an outward repentance. Rending your heart or your mind is a true repentance of your inner being. And turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repent of him of the evil. These words almost verbatim of what where God revealed his inner nature to Moses in Exodus chapter 34, verse 6. It made me think of another scripture just then, uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, I believe it is. Did you know it's not God's will that any perish? Any of his, he doesn't want any of his children to perish. He would rather all come to repentance. Who knoweth if he will return and repent? I think this better would come across better if you said perhaps Yahweh will return and repent and have a blessing behind him, even a meat offering and a drink offering unto the Lord your God, as opposed to that offering and sacrifice taken away by the locust army in, in Joel chapter 1, verses 9 and 13. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Sanctify a fast. No, not a feast. This is a fast. Call a solemn assembly, a day of restraint. Here's where part of uh, you come in, the next two verses. Gather the people. Sanctify the congregation. Assemble the elders. Gather the children. And those that suck the breasts, even the infants, let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. This word closet better translated or bridal canopy. All, what all this verse means is that no one is exempt from this, including all, even the children. 17. Let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, notice now these aren't ministers of Satan, these are the ministers of the Lord, you fit into that category? Weep between the porch and the altar, this being immediately before the holy place where the sanctuary of God was located. And let them say, Spare thy people, O Lord, and give not thine heritage, thine heritage to reproach, that the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the people, Where is their God? Beloved, let me tell you something. When that locust army is in full gear with Antichrist and the Philium and the Kenites, and all the world is following after him, and they think Antichrist is Jesus Christ, what are they going to be saying to you? They're going to be saying that last question there. Where is your God? We know where our God is. We know when he's due, what timetable it will happen, that he'll be back coming to us. Don't be dismayed. Verse 18. And when you ask God, help is on the way, right? Verse 18. Then will the Lord be jealous for his land and pity his people. Exodus chapter 34, verse 14. It states, his name, our Father's name is jealous for his land and pity his people. This is the last verse, almost word for word, of Deuteronomy 32. Last verse of the Song of Moses, that that remnant that overcomes Antichrist will be singing. And it pretty much sums up the Lord's day. Pity for his people. He is merciful. Thank goodness. Verse 19. Yea, the Lord will answer and say unto his people, Behold, I will send you corn. Think spiritual now. We're not talking physical. And wine and oil. Oil always symbolic of truth. And you shall be satisfied therewith. And I will no more make you a reproach, reproach among the heathen as, to the, as opposed to the destruction of that locust army back in chapter 1 of Joel. Verse 20. But I, this is Yahweh speaking, will remove far off from you the northern army. This is that locust army we've been talking about. And will drive him unto a land barren and desolate with his face toward the East Sea. This is the Dead Sea. And his hinder part toward the utmost sea. This being the Great Sea. And his stink shall come up and his ill savor shall come up because he hath done great things same event is written of in Ezekiel chapter 39, verse 11, the battle of Hamangog. 
Are we involved in the battle of Haman God? Nope, not really. Friends, that's when Christ's feet hit the ground, and I think we want to be on the on the, the way to retreat at that point, because he doesn't need our help. Believe that or not, at that point, let me say, he doesn't need our help. There is something he wants us to help him with, though. We're going to find that out in a minute. But he hath done great things here, you could even think of as a type for Antichrist, because he exalted himself, as it's written in Isaiah chapter 14. He wants to be God. That's Satan's plan. 21, fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. God will take care of them. God will take care of his elect right now. Be not afraid, ye beasts of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness do spring, for the tree beareth her fruit, the fig tree and the vine do yield their strength. 23, be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. For he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. Note the word month is in italics, it's not in the manuscripts. Again, think spiritual, folks. We're not talking about locusts that wiped out everything. We're talking about the complete deception of the world, that there is not one ounce of truth in anything that they say. And all of our brothers and sisters have been deceived, and God's promising here, I'll make it like it was before the locusts. 24. And the floors shall be full of wheat, and the vats shall overflow with wine and oil, plenty of truth for everyone. And I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm, and the caterpillar, and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. He's referring to that locust army as his army. And believe me, friends, he has control over that army as well. He's going to allow these things to happen. But let me tell you something. If they don't play by his rules, what did he command them in, in Revelation chapter 9? He said, you, touch, you don't touch my people that have the seal of God in their mind. I tell you, if that locust army touches one of his that has the seal of God, I think all bets are off. The rules change. We're not talking five months anymore. He'll come down. Verse 26. And ye shall eat in plenty and be satisfied. And praise the name of the Lord your God that hath dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be ashamed. There'll be some that'll be wishing mountains fell on them, though. Uh, I feel for them. Verse 27. And ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I am the Lord your God, and none else, and my people shall never be ashamed. Joel, the very word itself, the book we're in now, means Yahweh is God. That's the whole purpose here. Before the Lord, the, 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 the day of the Lord... We have Antichrist claiming to be God. The very name Joel itself means Yahweh is God. That's, that's what you and I have to keep in mind. We have to be ready to witness to that very fact. That's where we come in, verse 28. And it shall come to pass afterward. Not maybe, shall come to pass afterward. This is after Antichrist arrives with his locust army. That I, this is the Lord speaking, will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions. Poured out on all flesh. Now, how would we communicate something to all flesh today? I mean, since the Tower of Babylon in Genesis chapter 11, we have different languages everywhere. This is the very Pentecost, that cloven tongue spoken of on Acts chapter 2 that came to them on Pentecost Day. Peter himself said, this is that which Joel the prophet spoke of. That's the part you have in overcoming this locust army, is being prepared mentally and spiritually to stand and testify. And again, remember, we're not to premeditate what we're to say, but... Not like those that have been bitten by that scorpion and have no backbone. 
We have the backbone to stand and let the Holy Spirit speak through us. Verse 29. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids. Well, women are going to be involved in this. Notice we had sons and daughters and handmaids. In those days will I pour out my Spirit, that Holy Spirit given on Pentecost Day, promised by Christ that he would send that comforter. That language that, when spoken, everyone in the world understands. Verse 30, And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire, and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness. It sounds a lot like a lot of revelation, doesn't it? And the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. 32 to complete this lecture. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord hath said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. This better translated, for in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be a deliverance of the remnant. That remnant that won't be devoured, won't be consumed by that locust army. Going back, in what's Satan's plan, or God's plan, let me back up, God's plan was through the seed of Eve would come Messiah. Satan's plan, send the Nephilim, pollute them. Second, God's plan, through the seed of Abraham will come Messiah. Satan, send in the Nephilim. Let's pollute that seed line. What is God, what is, what is Satan's thought right now? I think he thinks he's good enough that even the remnant, even the elect, he can deceive. Therefore, making void the word of God, and he would avert the doom that's a forecast in God's word. Do you think there's any possibility of that coming to pass? I know it won't because I know you. I know you well enough to know that you hate Satan. You, you know that he is an abomination and you stand ready to stand and allow the Holy Spirit to speak through you. Therefore, Satan's plan comes to naught. Not God's word coming to naught. Let's go to the Father. Yahweh, dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your written word, Father. Your, your Son told us that, behold, I have foretold you all things. Father, give us the wisdom. Give us the knowledge of your word to search your word, Father, so that we do know all things, especially concerning the end of this time, Father. We so want to serve you, Father. We want to be better servants for you. Give us wisdom and knowledge so that we can do that, Father. Communicate that to us, won't you do that? In Yeshua, Jesus' precious name, amen.